and failure. But we can be comforted in the fact that God's grace and his love and his forgiveness is pouring into us when we come to him, when we empty ourselves to Jesus, he will comfort us. So those who mourn are blessed, for they will be comforted. The third beatitude, the the gentle or the meek are blessed, for they will inherit the earth. So my, my Bible says the gentle, right? The gentle are blessed. And that's because they're trying to define meek, and it's a really hard word to to try and define, apparently. Uh, But what I could find is that meekness is is a modesty in behavior. It's not arrogance, but you aren't a pushover, right? You're more eager to submit. And so a meek person has learned that they rely on God, right? Right? That they, they don't rely on the earthly things, <clears throat> their earthly status. They rely on God. And <clears throat> God said in Numbers 12, verse 3, he said, Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth. And so you could read the story of Moses. It starts in, <clears throat> in Exodus uh, chapter 2, but you can read it in, in Numbers, that particular verse. But Moses was a man of meekness. I mean, he, he was slow to speak. He was, he was gentle in everything that he did. And he never kind of used his power, right? I mean, the, the one moment where he was this crazy, powerful moment was the Ten Commandments, but that was given to him by God, the, the authority by God. Um, but he was slow to speak. He was a, a leader that was humble. And Jesus was meek. And the Jews of this time, they didn't expect their, their Messiah to be meek. They wanted this valiant warrior that was going to come and overthrow the Roman government and just be this powerful person on an outward sense. But Jesus was meek. He was humble. He still flipped tables, but he was slower to speak. And and he wasn't arrogant or prideful. So we are called to be meek. We are called to be meek. The fourth one, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are blessed, for they will be filled. And so if, if you look at the eight Beatitudes, the first three kind of symbolize an emptying of self, like a, a surrendering to God that you need him, you want him in your life. <clears throat> in this Beatitude, the fourth one, it implies that all that emptying, all of that realization that you're spiritually inept, all of that leads to you thirsting and hungering for righteousness. And what righteousness means is being right with God. And so after you realize, I need God, I am empty, I am bankrupt without him, then you thirst for righteousness. You thirst for being right in God's eyes. Right? And so Abraham was a perfect example of this. And you can find him in, in Genesis 12. The message version of this particular beatitude says, You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. His food and drink is the best meal you'll ever eat. And so when you look at at Abraham, I mean, he had an appetite for God. I mean, he left everything he was and did, left his family, his upbringing, to follow God and his promises. And he was so hungry for, for righteousness, so hungry for being right with God, that he was willing to sacrifice Isaac to be right with God. If that meant he could be right with God, he was going to do it. And so oftentimes when we are spiritually bankrupt or we're inept, we empty ourselves into other things. We don't empty ourselves into God as much as we should. We empty ourselves into earthly things, earthly habits or addictions or bad relationships. But what Jesus is calling us to do is empty yourself into me, Thirst for me in righteousness, in being right with God. And so we should be hungry, we should be thirsty for righteousness. The fifth beatitude, the merciful are blessed, for they will be shown mercy. So being merciful is basically you're, you're generous, you're compassionate, you're forgiving. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. And so again, a recap, the first three three Beatitudes are emptying of self, 
so that you can be filled with the fourth beatitude, filled with righteousness, to be right with God. And then after we are filled, after we are seeking to be filled, these next three beatitudes are what we should be aiming for. We should be looking to be merciful. We should strive to show mercy, real mercy. And mercy in, in, in Hebrew is to get inside someone's skin. So it's to understand, put yourself in someone else's shoes and understand where they're coming from or their struggles and caring and having this compassion for them and showing mercy to them. And the perfect example here is Rahab. And you can find her story. <clears throat> she's, in, she's introduced in Joshua 2, but she, you can find the, the bulk or summary of her story in Joshua 6 at the very end. And Rahab, if you don't know her story, she was this prostitute inside of Jericho. And these two spies, the, the spies of Joshua, of the Israelites, coming to scope out this promised land, they were inside of the walls and they were caught by Rahab. And Rahab, she could have just handed them over to other people in the kingdom. She could have had them killed. But she showed mercy on them. She was like, well, if I let you go, you know, your people, your God will conquer this city. Show mercy on me. Save me, save my family, and I will let you go. And she didn't know these foreigners. She didn't. She had really had no reason to trust these, these men, but she did. She showed mercy on them, and she trusted that she would have mercy shown on her in return. And in, and in, jo in Joshua 6, when you learn that they conquered the wall of Jericho, or they, they get into the wall of Jericho, they conquer the entire city, and they kill everyone in the city, and they show mercy on Rahab. They show mercy. The merciful are blessed because they will be shown mercy. And so we're called, it should be second nature for us as a true, authentic follower of Jesus to show mercy. And that, that should be our response. Mercy and grace. That's what Jesus is calling us to do. The sixth beatitude, the pure in heart are blessed for, the, for they will see God. And in this context, the word pure is referring to this washing this, 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 pure, this purifying washing inside, a heart purification. And the Pharisees during this time, they weren't concerned with inside stuff, inward healing or purity. They were concerned with outward observances of righteousness. How can we show you that we have a faith in God? You need to show people that you have a faith in God. But God is not concerned about the outside. He's concerned about the inside. <clears throat> He's concerned about our heart. And that is what Jesus was telling us. Our hearts need to be cleansed. And once they're cleansed, once we accept Jesus as our Savior and we're created anew, then we see the world differently. The message version says, you're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and your heart, put right. Then you see God in the outside world. And so a great example here is Saul, who is known as Paul now, on the road to Damascus. This is a murderer, a Christian killer. On the road to Damascus, gets blinded and, and thrown to the ground and hears the word of God, the voice of Jesus saying, why do you persecute me? And through this whole experience, he, he believes in Jesus and he is saved in this, in this experience, and he's cleaned, he's cleansed and made pure. His heart is made pure. And from that point on, he became the greatest missionary to ever live. I mean, Christianity would not be the same without the Apostle Paul. And so once his insides were new, were pure, it affected how he saw the outside world. He saw God in the outside world. The pure in heart will see God and experience God. No, number seven, the peacemakers are blessed, for they will be called sons of God. And if you stay in the ninth chapter of Acts, at the very end, after the point where Paul is, is saved and he's not blinded after three days, and he, he wakes up and he is like on fire, 
for God. He wants to go and, and preach to the world about Jesus. And there was a dilemma because the disciples looked at this guy as a Christian killer. I mean, his insides were, were created anew. He was, he was a new man with new vision and a new hope, but he was still on the outside. He, that, that is still Saul. He, I, I saw him kill Stephen, right? I mean, I saw him kill people. And so the disciples were not very receptive to this new Paul. They didn't really trust him. And there was this man named Barnabas who was a peacemaker. And Barnabas stepped in and he spoke for Paul to the disciples saying, look, this is what happened to Paul. He saw Jesus, he heard from Jesus, and he is created anew. He is made pure and he wants to preach the word. He wants to preach the gospel. And so from that point on, Paul did just that. He went with the disciples. And so if it wasn't for Barnabas, if it wasn't for this great peacemaker, again, how different would the world be today? If Paul had never gotten the support of the apostles, of the other followers of Jesus, how different would it be? And so a, a peacemaker doesn't just want to jump into, you know, an argument. He wants to bring good to people's lives. You know, peacemakers care about the corruption in the world, just like Jesus did. Jesus came to fix the corruption in the religious system. Peacemakers want to fix the corruption in, in the world, regardless of how you do it. So we're called to be peacemakers. Peacemakers bring others to God. That should be our goal. In the last uh, beatitude, <clears throat> those who persecute who are persecuted for righteousness are blessed, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And the, the message version says, you're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The, per the persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. And so this was Jesus' initial speech to people. You know, if this was just all a gimmick, if this was just a bunch of pie-in-the-sky rhetoric, do you think he would emphasize right away that if you follow me, if you believe in me, you surrender yourself, empty yourself to me, and you become a follower of me, you are going to be persecuted. It, would he preach that right away if this was just all made up? And people right away, they knew that they were going to be persecuted. Jesus told them that. But they still believed, and they still followed and the persecution that, that, that transpired grew the church, and it continues to grow the church. Across the world today, other countries experience persecution like we don't understand, but it continues to grow the church. Prophets were persecuted. The apostles were persecuted. Most of them died for their faith. But Jesus says we can rejoice through that because the persecution... Through the persecution, we are accessed to this world, this heavenly world, this heavenly realm, this eternal life. Through the persecution, your reward in heaven will be great. And I want to end this message with this little passage from this book. It's called Feasting on the Gospels by Nancy Bedford. And she says, The, the Beatitudes is not a to-do list. It's not phrased as commands. Instead, it's a proclamation of God's reality. Who are the important people in God's kingdom? Those who have little, those who have lost much, those to whom uh, justice had been denied, those who are gentle, those who show mercy, those who promote peace, the innocent, the bullied, the mistreated, the oppressed. They are the powerless. And Jesus isn't calling us to go and get persecuted, but to honor those who are. And as we do this, honoring and lifting up these qualities, we will be transformed to do the same. We will align our own priorities with God's. And so Jesus is concerned about what we are. He's concerned about our hearts. Because what we are determines what we do. Right? Demonstration is greater than explanation. 
We can know the Bible in and out. But if you aren't living the life that Christ teaches us to live, if you aren't demonstrating the love and mercy and grace of Jesus, what are you doing? Right? And so today, as you think about the Beatitudes, which Beatitude maybe stuck out for you? Maybe which Beatitude do you need to work on or do you need to think about? Are you poor in spirit? Are you mourning? Are you, are you, are you meek? Are you hungering for righteousness? Are you anxious and thirsting to be right with God? Are you showing mercy to people? Is your heart pure? Are you a peacemaker? What beatitude is speaking to you most right now? And through the Sermon on the Mount, through this series, I hope and pray that Jesus speaks to you. And I pray that he, he communicates with you how to be a better version of yourself through him. To be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. Let's pray.